Hello, welcome to Thor Talk, the show all about Marvel's resident, God of Thunder. On this episode of Thor Talk, Thor finds himself on death's door after a battle with the gods of Midgard went wrong. As he hovers between life and death, he finds himself face to face with Donald Blake, his fallen shadow. Finally, the heir to Asgard's throne has arrived, Thor's son, Magni. Father and son are reunited at last on Thor Talk. I am Thor the Thunderer, son of Odin, prince of Asgard, and this world is under my protection. The Immortal Thor number 17 was written by Al Ewing and was published in November of 2024. The issue begins with a stanza from the Eddic poem Favnismal and reads as follows. Young fellow, young fellow, by what fellow art thou begot? Of what people art thou the son? These words are spoken by the dragon Favnir after he is stabbed fatally in the heart by Sigurd. Since he is going to die, Favnir wants to know who it was that killed him, and speaks this line, asking who the young fellow is and who is his father. This line relates to the story because that is the central question for the second half of the issue. Amora wants to restore her son, but which son, and who is his father? Eric, son of Bror, Ove, son of Namor, or Magni, son of Thor? Now, let's begin the story. Thor was framed for the murder of Dario Agar, and he came to Earth to clear his name, but was met with a trap. Agar was resurrected and assembled the gods of Midgard, a team made up of Thor's old foes. Radioactive Man, Mr. Hyde, Cobra, and Grey Gargoyle were all given greater power, and they used it to ambush Thor. In a sneak attack, Grey Gargoyle turned Thor to stone, and Mr. Hyde smashed that stone Thor, dooming the God of Thunder. Or so they thought. Thor gazed into eternity and saw nothing. No star to guide him no bird to show him a sign. So, as before, he stripped his mind of thoughts, closed his eyes, and breathed deep the slumber of the gods. These lines are a very clear reference to the ones Thor spoke in Thor number 85, when, after freeing the gods from Ragnarok, he had nowhere to go, so he slept the slumber of the gods. Now, he does so again. A voice calls out to him in the darkness. Thor, you're dying, Thor, but not yet dead. Thor's shadow Donald Blake emerged with serpent's venom dripping from his eyes. When Amora stole Blake's body to make him the keep, Thor placed Blake's head in a land of dreams so that he might know peace. But Jormungandr, the world serpent, found him and corrupted him. Blake went on a killing spree. Now he has been imprisoned by Loki, but he and Thor are still connected. When Ragnarok occurred, Thor's spirit came here, to Vith Blain and Blake warned him that Midgard would end if he did not return. Now, Blake asks if Thor believes him now that he has seen Gaia's wrath and the power of the Utgard gods. His face shifts to that of a monster as he mocks him. Once again, Thor sleeps the slumber of the gods, and once again he finds himself in the Void. Here, the Void is given a name, which it didn't have before. Taken from Norse mythology, Vidblain is where the dead dwell after Ragnarok. Just like in Thor Volume 3 Number 1, Thor is summoned in the Void by Donald Blake, and there are several explicit references to this meeting here. Most notably, Blake reminds Thor how he warns that if Thor did not return to balance things at the right time, then Earth would become a fiery wasteland with bodies piled high. J. Michael Straczynski, who wrote that issue, ended up cutting his Thor series short, so we never saw what Thor explicitly had to stop. However, Ewing has Blake explicitly saying that Gaia's wrath and the Elder Gods are what is going to cause this, and honestly, that makes a lot of sense. Something I've always thought was rather interesting is that Earth itself seems to be standing in that image. Usually, world-ending threats actually destroy the world, but only mankind and its structures were destroyed here. It's clever of Ewing to pick up the plot point that Straczynski never got to address. Speaking of plot points that other Thor writers never got to address, Donald Blake returns after some dramatic changes in Donny Cates' Thor run. I'm glad Ewing does his best to draw together all the different stories about Blake to make one coherent narrative, because I was never really sure how he ended up where he ended up. Matt Fraction had Thor put Blake in the Nightmare's dream realm, but Cates had Blake trapped in a completely different dream realm invented by Odin. Now we find out that Blake was just sent to Odin's dream realm by Thor, even if perhaps unintentionally. 
Thor remains cool and asks Blake what he wants. It's unclear if Thor's death will free Blake or if he'll die too, but Blake wants to see that for himself. When Donald Blake first called Thor out of Ragnarok, he warned that there were dark creatures that wanted him to stay in Vidblain. Back then, Thor was able to fight them off and return, but now, his body is broken and there is nowhere to return to. The gods of Midgard stand shocked around the broken king of Asgard. In one minute, Thor's body will be flesh, and he will perish. Mr. Hyde is gleeful and wants to lap up his god blood like a dog. Great Gargoyle is horrified that it went this far and wants to look away. Cobra wants to look closer, to study the process and satisfy his curiosity. Radioactive Man does not want to look away, as he wants to face what he's done. But what they've done changes before their eyes. Green energy begins to lift up the pieces of Thor's stone body. As Thor fights the monsters of the void, his body is put back together. The spell has worn off. Radioactive Man tells his allies to get ready, because Thor will not be pleased with them. I, verily. Greg Gargoyle panics, thinking the strike will cause Radioactive Man to go off. He reassures his allies that it will take more than that. But not much more. You are all fighting me in a place with no civilians, with nothing holding me back, while in the company of a walking bomb. Did you think that through? Mr. Hyde thinks he's bluffing and attacks, but he's quickly beaten unconscious. Cobra stammers that Thor is bluffing. Am I? I have fought Ragnarok's little Cobra. I have been the death of gods. Do you think I will not stoop to your red slaughter? Do you? Cobra radios for Evac, and the gods of Midgard flee from the God of Thunder. Amora emerges, complimenting Thor on a job well done, but Thor disagrees. A gang of rogues that barely troubled him before he was Allfather nearly bested him through surprise and trickery. Thor thanks her for putting his body back together, and Amora reminds him what she wants in return. Her son brought back to life. Neither magic nor blackmail could force Thor to honor her request, but his own conscience was a different matter. The two return to Asgard. So, I have quite a bit to say about these last few scenes and Thor's battle with the gods of Midgard. These last two issues have really showcased the duality of Al Ewing as a writer, both strengths and weaknesses. On the strength side, he is a continuity nut, and I love it. The way he masterfully ties together different references and plot points from comic books that came out decades apart is amazing. Just at this point in this issue, we have references to Michael Ivan Oming's Ragnarok story, J. Michael Straczynski's Thor Reborn run, Matt Fraction's Thor run, Donny Cates' Thor run, and even Norse mythology with the name Vidblain. One last reference is to Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Thor run, with the gods of Midgard being four Silver Age Thor villains. However, that's where the problems arise. Ewing is not particularly good at writing fight scenes. Part of this is, despite being a continuity nerd, he doesn't really take power scaling into account as much as he could. Thor, at this point in the story, has the power of Odin, the power of Zeus, and three Mjolnir-level weapons. I know Thor was taken by surprise, and his enemies seem to have gotten a power upgrade, but it shouldn't matter. Odin's been able to hang with Galactus on occasion, and Thor is more than twice as powerful as Odin now. Can you see Grey Gargoyle turning Galactus to stone, even for a moment? This particular combination of villains would give base Thor trouble, but at this point, they're on different levels. Plus, Yolgjord should probably do more than slightly inconvenience Grey Gargoyle's spell. If this belt of protection can completely nullify Scald magic, then Grey Gargoyle shouldn't be a problem. It was great to see Thor using his wits to win this fight, as he forced the gods of Midgard to flee. But he shouldn't really need to rely on his wits here. Still, Thor's rage at the indignity he suffered and coldly challenging the notion he wouldn't kill them was an awesome moment. Elsewhere, the gods of Midgard returned to Dario Agar. They failed to kill Thor, but their goal was only to stop him from clearing his name. But in time, they will get a rematch. In his hall, Uller attends the secret fire, a thing bound to fate. Sif tries to get Thor to reconsider, but his mind is made up. Thor was not with Eric in his hour of need, but Amora was with Thor in his. Honor leads his mind to where his heart already was. While Eric does deserve Valhalla, 
he also deserves to see his mother again. Amora will use the telling fire to cast a spell, and Thor's all power will fuel that spell and her son will be restored. Thor briefly grows suspicious as he recalls that Amora has more than one son in need of restoring. Ove, her son with Namor from a possible future, lost much in a battle with Captain Marvel, and Amora swore vengeance. While she did swear revenge on Captain Marvel, Amora gives her word that this has nothing to do with Ove, and swears that oath upon her own blood. The blood is dripped into the flames to seek its own. Through the all power, she casts the spell to find her lost son. Through the veil of death, and all doorways, and all voids, and past fate itself, she commands, Let my child be restored to me. The words echoed like the thunder in the deep, for this was deep magic indeed. And when that great and terrible work was done, Amora knew triumph. My son is alive. Thor's eyes still sting from the process, but Sif's eyes see who has been brought forth. It's not Eric, and it's not Ove either. It's someone she's never seen before. A voice calls out to his mother. He remembers a battle for Asgard, and then time itself ended. Thor recognizes that voice. Amora admits that Thor was right. Eric deserves his rest, and Ove made his own bed. But she still did study future timelines for Ove's sake. Through this, she learned she had another son from a future that was no more, because Thor's future self undid it. He also gave Thor memories from this future to make sure that none of it happened. But there was one light in that dark age. While some barriers should never be broken, Thor still regretted losing him. The young man before him asks if it is truly Thor the Allfather before him. Tis I. Hello, Magni. Hello, my son. I can't believe it. Magni is back. Once again, Ewing makes a deep cut to a previous Thor run that I thought was long forgotten by Marvel. The first time Thor became king of Asgard, he made some mistakes. His desire to protect Earth and Asgard led to him taking control of both. The gods of Asgard ruled absolutely, and no one challenged Thor. Save one. Thor married the Enchantress and had a son, Magni, who became worthy of Mjolnir and helped show his father the error of his ways. Thor then went back in time and corrected things, but before he did, he said goodbye to Magni. Even though it seemed impossible, he hoped to know his son again. And now he gets that chance. Once again through the union of Thor and Amora, Magni is born into the world. This is a fan-favorite character and an important one from Norse mythology, but it's difficult to bring him back naturally. As Thor says, some barriers should not be broken. If he brings back one person from that doomed timeline, then why not another? And what is the cost of doing that? Amora is the perfect catalyst to bring this about, and it was a stroke of genius on Ewing's part to use Ove. Amora doesn't know that Magni exists, and she would have no reason to look unless she was already looking at future timelines. Thor is too responsible and noble to risk bringing his son back, but Amora, if armed with that knowledge, would absolutely do it. Overall, a really solid issue. As I said, we did get to see some of Ewing's weaknesses on display, but they were countered by the most impressive display of his strengths I've ever seen. The way he perfectly weaves in different references makes this feel not just like another Immortal Thor issue, but another chapter of a story that's been going on since 1962. And I can't wait to see the next issue. Well, that's all for this episode of Thor Talk. I hope you enjoyed it. I apologize for not covering issue 16. I got busy with other things, but I'm glad I was able to do this amazing issue. I'm a fan of Dan Jurgen's run, and of Magni in particular, so it makes me happy to see him back. Thor now joins the likes of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and the Hulk in having a child in the main continuity. And that's pretty cool. With that being said, see you next time on Thor Talk, where... You behold in breathless wonder!